All right, I am very pleased to welcome you to the first workshop of the symposium. Um, we have uh, with us today from Geneva, Dr. Carmen Decu Teodorescu, who is postdoctoral assistant in art history at the University of Geneva, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. She specializes in French artistic production of the 15th and 16th centuries. Her scientific publications have revealed a number of discoveries leading to major advances in various topics related to French art circa 1500. Since 2015, she has worked within the program Pendre en France à la Renaissance, and she is in charge of a master seminar devoted to connoisseurship and painting in France in the 15th and 16th centuries. She is currently preparing a methodological essay on the commonplaces which still prevail among scholars regarding French art of the Renaissance. Professor in art history and museology at the University of Geneva, Frédéric Elzik is a specialist in European painting of the 15th and 16th centuries. He is the author of Geronimus Bosch in 2004, Painting in France in, 15th century, in the 15th century, also 2004, L'Arte del Quattrocento al Nord, al Nord delle Alpi in 2011, La Peinture dans le Duché de Savoie à la fin du Moyen Âge, in 2016, Grégoire Gerard, 2017, and two forthcoming books, Antoine Deloni, in 2018, and Quantorship et Histoire de l'Art, Geneva 2018, responsible for several exhibitions such as Conrad Witz and Geneva in 2013, and Catalogue Raisonné of Old Masters in Geneva, Lausanne, Lyon. He is currently directing the program Pendre en France à la Renaissance. Please welcome our visitor. Thank you. We would like to thank the symposium's organizing committee who provides us the opportunity to present some results of the program Peindre en France à la Renaissance, initiated in 2010 at the University of Geneva. This program has the ambition to reconstruct painting produced in the Kingdom of France and the dynamic of artistic exchanges between the cultural center uh, by taking into account a wide array of techniques used at the time by the painters, wood painting, drawing, stained glass, and so on. Its main goal is to rediscover unknown works and artists. The program has made several discoveries that profoundly challenge our perception of the French artistic context known for the 15th and 16th centuries. It has already produced six volumes. The first two define the methodological framework, while the following four focus on important artistic centers, Lyon in 2014, Troyes in 2015, Dijon in 2016, and Rouen in 2017. The seventh volume, devoted to Bourges, will be published this December. Next year, we will deal with Avignon. Our main lines of investigation, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our main lines of investigation are simultaneously the documentary survey. We are searching for new sources, but most of the time it was sufficient to return to already known sources in order to renew the questioning, and a large territorial wrecking in search of forgotten, unreported, unreported paintings. We are also work closely with the museal institutions and the art market. Our principal approach is based on the connoisseurship methods. First, we define the stylistic identity of anonymous works. 
Secondly, we try to group them with others' works in order to resurrect forgotten personalities of painters. Finally, and when it is possible, we aim to identify them. <laughs> in view with a colloquy propose, we will focus our speech today on what makes illumination so special for our research. Its interplay with other artistic media allows us to present you examples among the most spectacular results of the program. We will divide our communication in two parts. The first one will examine what might be termed as autograph techniques, such as illumination, panel painting, and mural painting. Um, in other words, techniques that require a direct intervention of the painter. The second part will interrogate the allograph techniques in which the invention of the illuminator or the painter is generally executed by another craftsman specialized in stained glass, embroidery, tapestry, or even sculpture. In the uh, reconstruction of a stylistic personality, it is important to take into account all the techniques implied by the profession of the painter in order to understand the different aspects of an individual itinerary and the stylistic development often interconnected with the artist's way to handle different techniques. Therefore, it is important to begin with the autograph techniques in which the invention and the execution are due to the same hand. In this perspective, one must distinguish between the mobile supports, such as illuminated manuscripts or panel paintings, and the immovable supports, such as mural paintings, because they serve as anchor points in the artistic geography. Mural painting made possible the relocation on stylistic criteria of illuminated man manuscripts that cannot be localized otherwise in a specific regional area. To put things clearly, we are going to evoke the case of an isolated book of ours preserved today in the Renate Koenig collection in Cologne. It reveals a Roman use and was situated by scholars in Paris around 1400 on the basis of very generical stylistic criteria. criteria despite the fact that it shows a connection with the Avignonese culture, in particular in the gray color of the carnation and the interpretation of Italian Bolognese models. We proposed to bring it closer to a mural painting in the church of Saint Bonnet le Château near Lyon and the Rhone Valley, commissioned by the Bourbon family because it seems, it seems to share the same characteristics observable at the level of rude morphologies and dry manner. There is enough resemblance to wonder if it is not the same hand on two different media and scales. The anonymous master, who could be designated by the no not name of Master of Saint Bonnet le Chateau, is active in this region around 1410-20 after a training in Avignon. He also seems to be responsible for a series of painted stalls in the church of Charlieu in the same region here on the right, unfortunately very repainted today, but which shows, however, specificities such as rude morphologies. We could identify him with Ludovicus Vobis, 
painter documented at saint bonnet le chateau between 1416 and 1426, but this identification remains very hypothetical for the moment and needs additional proofs. When a richer corpus can be reconstructed, illumination often serves in the field of French painting of the 15th century as a reference technique, highlighting an important principle of the connoisseurship, the principle of the, in, of the intermediate link, which presupposes a continuity in a stylistic development in the sequence of works stylistically related to each other's in a coherent whole. The attribution is a dynamic operation which always has to take into account this principle in order to reconstruct a chronology on the, ba on the, ba the basis of dated works serving as milestones. Let's take the case of the painter Jean Batteur, documented in Geneva and at the court of Savoy from 1427 to 1457. He is a painter who was involved in different tasks, such as scenography of feasts, but he is mainly known as an illuminator. Between 1428 and 1432, he was paid for the ap apocalypse of the Duke Amedeus VIII, identified with a manuscript preserved now in the Escorial, in the middle, and which served as a starting point for the attribution of other illuminated manuscripts such as the breviary of Saint Colette, uh, Saint Colette of Besançon, around 1425 on the left, and the De Doctrina Dicendi of Brussels, around 1434 on the right, which share with the Escorial Apocalypse the same expressivity defined by the dry drawing and by the angular faces fitted with big noses. Our program made possible to attribute to him another manuscript, unknown, the Pontifical of Amedeus of Talaru, now in the seminary of Besançon, dated around 1420 on the left, which underlines the initial Avignonese training of the painter and allows us to understand the beginning of his career. According to the principle of the intermediate link, his stylistic development can be seen as a continuity. In order to understand the end of his career, the crucifixion of the Museo Civico in Turin plays a pivotal role. It was attributed to a French primitive in 1904 and to the master of Encarnacion, now recognized as Louis Alimbrot by Chandler Post in 1952 uh, uh, before being related to Jean Batteur by Andreina Griseri in 1963, but totally rejected by Charles Sterling in 1969. We suggested to attribute it again to Jean Batteur at the occasion of the exhibition El Renacimiento Mediterraneo in Madrid in 2001. Butter's painting combines the Avignonese expressivity with elements of Ars Nova, particularly the models of Robert Campin, as we can observe in the compar comparison between the detail of the crucifixion 
and that of the Prado marriage of the Virgin. Painted in Geneva around 1440, it suggests that Jean Batteur followed his patron, the Duke Amedeus VIII of Savoy, who became in 1439 the Pope Felix V in the Council of Basel. And so different Flemish paintings, probably by Robert Campin, at this occasion. The attribution of the cru crucifixion to Jean Batteur makes also plausible that of a miniatures, miniature of the Salus Hours, the massacre of the innocents, realized at the beginning of the 1450s and which could count among the last works of the painter. At last, Batter's illumination generates in turn questioning about mural paintings. According to documents, he led teams of, paint, of painters for the mural decoration of the different ducal residences. The mural painting of All Saints Chapel in Geneva Saint Gervais Church could represent a testimony of this kind of collaboration. It shows the four evangelists realized around 1440-45 by painters, two painters still attached to the formulas of the international Gothic and who probably worked under the supervision of Jean Batteur. At the end of the process, Jean Batteur painted only some details, such as the man with the letter at the window, whose triangular face recalls that of the De Doctrina Dicendi in Brussels on the left. Illumination also gives a proper basis for a geographical relocation of wood paintings. We should stop now on a case where a wrong identification of a painter literally blocked the understanding of the intermedial exchanges. Till now, scholars misunderstood the connection between two stylistic groups. On one hand, the illuminated manuscript attributed to the master of the Burgundian prelates, active in Dijon. On the other hand, a group of panel paintings attributed to Jos Liferinx and situated in Provence, plus pre uh, more precisely in Marseille and Avignon. The link is quite visible if we observe the crucifixion of the missal of Richard Chambelin, a canon from Dijon, by the master of the Burgundian prelates at the left, and the crucifixion attributed to Lieferanx by Charles Sterling and acquired by the Louvre in 1962 on the right. It is almost the same model, and above all, both are the only known paintings showing a crucifixion with the fall of the rebel angels in the background. This issue was resolved by a discovery which renewed completely the entire question. In 1618, the Dijonese general attorney Hugues Picardet published a book, The Remontrance, in which he described in detail the crucifixion of the Parliament of Dijon, talking, among other details, about the iconographic particularities of the panel, like the episode of the fall of the rebel angels in the sky, the kneeling or the open mouth of Saint John, or the chromatic nuances. Actually, we are dealing here probably with one of the most complete descriptions in art history because it covers every single detail of the panel. And this very precise description fits perfectly with the crucifixion attributed to Jos Liferinx now in the Louvre. But what is more exceptional is the additional evidence represented by an unknown until our program engraving by Leonard Gautier, which accompanies the text and shows all the details of the painting now in the Louvre and give us, so, a real certificate of the provenance. The inscription below 
uh, the engraving says that this painting was indeed the famous crucifixion of the Dijon Parliament considered as missing since the revolution. This discovery has multiple and radical implications. The status of the painting changes, of course, because in French kingdom, institutional crucifixions enjoyed an almost sacred statu status. But there is a more important consequence of its presence in Dijon. The necessity to revise the dating of the painting and the identity of the painter. As a matter of fact, it makes impossible the identification of the painter with Lifferanx because he died before 1508 and this crucifixion was commissioned in 1511 at the beginning of the construction of the Dijon Parliament building. It also generates a domino effect because it obligates to interrogate the relevance of the corpus associated until now with the name of Lieferanx and the painting produced in Avignon associated with his name. And after careful observation, we propose to divide this corpus in three stylistic groups. One on the left is sensibly more expressive. Is it the master of the life of Saint Sebastian, the main author of an altarpiece of which several elements are preserved today in Philadelphia? In our eyes, he is very different from the master of the series of the life of the Virgin on the right. But the other two groups are closely connected. There are strong links that unite the works of the master of the life of the Virgin on the left and the master of the crucifixion of the Dijon Parliament on the right. It is the same artistic genome. However, and this was noted, even when the paintings were considered by Lieferanx, the life of the Virgin and the crucifixion seems to be made in different periods. Is it the later phase of the same painter or is it a second generation active at the beginning of the 16th century, trained by the master of the life of the Virgin? This second option is the better one. While the life of the Virgin is clearly anchored by its provenance in Avignon, the crucifixion is related clearly to Dijon's formulas. The iconography of St. John kneeling comes from the crucifixion of the chamber of the Count of Dijon. It was the building next to the Parliament one. The morphologies and faces of the angel are similar to stained glasses on the Dijonese territory. And above all, we have the rare presence of the, of the episode of the rebel angels in the sky, in the crucifixion by the master of the Burgundian prelates in the middle. It seems that we are dealing here with somebody active in Avignon at the end of the, six, of the 15th century, the master of the life of the Virgin, and a younger painter active in Dijon at the beginning of the 16th century. And there is only one name able to fill the geographical mm. and chronological mm. gap that this split of the corpus supposes while obeying in the same time at the principle of the stylistic coherence, Changenet, a Burgundian dynasty of painters, all trained in the same workshop and able to work on various media. It is interesting to observe that it has already been suspected by Nicole Reynaud that the master of the Burgundian prelates must be part of the Changenet workshop in Dijon. So the master of the crucifixion of the Parliament of Dijon must be Henri Changenet, documented as an important personality for the painting in Dijon at the beginning of the 16th century. But the most delicious consequence comes right now. <laughs> One of the members of this family, Jean Changenet, was active in Avignon between 1485 and 1496, where he appears to be the city's most, most prominent painter of the period. Until now, Jean Changenet was an artist who existed only by his name in the sources. 
not by his works, despite his identification by Charles Sterling with the painter of the three prophets in the Louvre. But it is an identification made more like a suggestion, not like a real demonstration. Thus, it was necessary to cross the several stages to begin to see who Jean Changenet might really be. We proposed to associate his name, uh, to associate the name of Jean Changenet from Avignon with the corpus of the master of the life of the Virgin, <coughs> not with uh, the three prophets in the Louvre. But if the reconstitution of a stylistic personality is fundamentally attached to the connoisseurship method of observation, its identification with a historical person remains risky because it depends on the existence of a documented or a signed work. Well, happiness never comes alone when one is on the, <laughs> when one, one is on the right way in the connoisseurship. Uh, a second discovery, the discovery of one of Jean Genet's documented works, confirmed this identification with the master of the life of the Virgin. In the church of Gretz Armandvilliers near Paris, there is a factist altarpiece composed by three wings showing the adoration of the Magi with a donor, the flight into Egypt and the assumption of the Virgin. Very damaged, the reverse shows the same patron of the city of Dijon, Benigne, and Saint Nicholas. The hand of two painters can easily be distinguished. The reverse shows an intimate knowledge of Jan van Eyck's models and of Burgundian sculpture, while the second painter responsible for the interior shows a language close to Provencal <laughs> Piedmontese production of the period around 1500. Because of the same patron and the iconography of the Virgin, these wings come from a church in Dijon, most probably Our Lady Church, and they exactly correspond to three of the four scenes of an altarpiece commissioned by Nicolas Busso for the Our Lady Church in Dijon, altarpiece begun by Jean Changenet in 1491 and achieved by his Piedmontese collaborator Giovanni Grassi in 1500. The contract mentions a fourth element, a massacre of the innocents now lost and we are still looking for it if you have any ideas. <laughs> but otherwise, everything matched perfectly with the document, the iconographic sequence, the same patrons, even the artificial insertion of the portrait of the donor put there tardily by Giovanni Grassi. As it is said in the contract, Jean Changelet had done the reverse. And I would like to make you sensitive to the importance of the Saint Benigne panel, because it is from now on a documented work by Jean Changenet from Avignon. The great Armand Villiers wings led us to find another work of collaboration between Changenet and Grassi, the, that is to say, the main altarpiece of the Carpent Carpentras Cathedral, previously considered as a copy after a lost panel of Lieferanx. The confrontation with the life of the Virgin supports the identification of Jean Changenet with the master of this series. It remains now to explain the exact relationship between Jean Changenet and the master of the Burgundian prelates, whose heterogeneous corpus corresponds to a Dijonese workshop, probably that of Jean's brother, Pierre Changenet. But we have the feeling that Jean Changenet is hiding behind the most raffinated miniature, miniatures by the master of the Burgundian prelates. We are currently preparing a book on the Changenet family, and we hope to find an answer at this question. At this point, we are arriving to the second part of our communication. In the reconstruction of a stylistic personality, we have to take into account not only the autograph techniques, but also the holograph techniques in which the conceptor is in general different from the executor. Recently rediscovered and identified on the basis of two documented works, 
Antoine Delony, whose personality proceeds from the fusion by François Avril of the master of the Salus, Salus Hours and the master of the Turin Trinity, is an exemplary case of the connoisseurship guided by a double decompartmentalization, geographical and technical. Successively active in Burgundy, in Languedoc, in Catalonia, and in the Duchy of Savoy from around 1445 to 1480, he is responsible for a series of illuminated manuscripts which serve as references to reconstruct his itinerary and understand the development of his language, characterized by the conjunction of the formulas of the international Gothic illumination, particularly those of the Bedford master, with the suggestions of Ars Nova, particularly those of Jan van Eyck, as we can observe in these representations of a funeral scene in different manuscripts in Paris, in New York, in Turin, in Cape Town, and in London. Trained as an illuminator, he also produced mural paintings such as the frescoes of the Dalbad convent in Toulouse, in the middle, and altarpieces such as the Fulk Pridella in a private collection on the right, adapting himself to the success successive contexts. Next to his direct interventions in manuscripts, mural paintings, and altarpieces, Antoine de Lony conceived drawings, patterns for other craftsmen, uh, craftsmen, such as embroiders, as attested by the embroideries of François de Pré, Bishop of Aosta, whose apostles recall those of a book of hours now in the Walters Art Library in Baltimore, executed during the 1470s. He also furnished drawings for sculptures, such as the master of the Pinerolo Annunciation, whose virgin in terracotta can be compared to the Saint Mary Magdalene that we propose to attribute to Antoine de Lony in 2001, or such as the anonymous sculptor who realized the wooden reliefs of the altarpiece commissioned around 1470-75 by Giorgio of Chalon for the high altar of the Collegiata dei Santi Pietro e Orso at Aosta. We easily can compare some of these reliefs with the apostles painted at the same period by Antoine de Lony and now preserved in the Museo Civico d'Arte Antica at Turin. It is rather rare that a painter also received a training as embroider or sculptor, while there are naturally exceptions, such as André Bonneveu, documented both as sculptor and painter in Bourges at the end of the 14th century, or Gérard Louf, painter and sculptor in Rouen uh, during the 15th century, or Jean Hortard, attested as a painter and embroider in Lyon in the middle of the 15th century, and who could be identified with the master of the Vienna Roman de la Rose. But at the intersection of autograph and holograph techniques, there is a field in which a direct intervention of a painter is much more frequent, the stained glass. In 1446, Antoine de Lony received from the Chancellor Nicolas Rollin a commission for drawings for stained glass windows for the castle of Autum, now destroyed, and executed by Evra Rubin, documented as a specialized glassmaker. 
At this period, he doesn't seem to practice himself painting on glass. But 15 years later, in 1460, he was paid for producing stained glass windows in the city house of Toulouse. He was then famous in the Mediterranean region, not only for his style, defined by the models of Ars Nova and attached to the prestige of the Duchy of Burgundy, but also for his double skill, painter and stained glass painter. In 1460-61, he is documented as the painter of the glass window of Santa Maria del Mar in Barcelona with a remarkable coronation of the Virgin at the right, whose invention was prepared by a series of miniatures, among others in the manuscripts in New York, Turin, and Chantilly, and whose execution reveals the same quality as the autograph works confirming the direct intervention of the painter. Actually, documentation about painters active in France in the 15th and 16th century shows that the double skill of painter and stained glass painter was frequent, but given only to the upper class of the painters, those authorized to handle any media from illumination to stained glass. The stained glass as the intersection of the autograph and allograph techniques was also crucial in the last example that we expose here because it served for the identification, for the possible identification of an important illuminator from Rouen. An entombment coming from, the church, uh, from a church in Saint-Étienne de Rouvray, a suburb of Rouen, lost on the art market in 1989, so if you have any ideas, mm -hmm. appears as an isolated work on French territory. But we were able to confirm its initial provenance from Rouen by confronting it with local remains like Gaillon sculpture and several stained glasses from the workshop of Jean Le Vieille, a painter who signed a window now in saint Jean d'Arc church in Rouen and who is easily recognizable by his imitation of the models of Arnold of Nijmegen. It should be noted that the painter adopts a very particular manner. He likes geometric faces with large eyelids, big and dark circles under the eyes, small fleshy mouth, cleft chin, hair always arranged in flat bands on either side of a central strip. But if the use of the same models allows us to link the painting to the workshop of Jean Levier, the same characteristics could be found <clears throat> in the miniatures of a painter, still anonymous, to whom is given the name of Master of Ango Hours, active in Rouen between 1510 and 1540. The Ango style, so easily recognizable, reveals a painter influenced by Italian art view in the early Renaissance Gaillon castle and Arnold of Nijmegen's models used in Rouen and Normandy stained glasses by Jean Levier's workshop. His ornamental register suggests strong parallels with Gaillon, we don't have it here, the image, but you have to believe me, and he copies sometimes directly Nijmegen's figures. He likes marmoreal white flesh as he was fascinated by the sculpture. He often looks mediocre in photo, when in reality his brush strokes are of extreme delicacy and virtuosity, and we must notice also his rare mastery of pigments, which makes his miniatures intact even today. He has a follower or an alter ego to whom is given the not name of Master of Girard Akari, active from 1520 to 1545 around. <laughs> Master of Girard Akari is just a more slender, feverish, and hatched Master of Ango, looking to Antwerp mannerism as it was popularized in Rouen by Angrand le Prince or in Paris by Godefroy le Batave 
and Noël Belmar, but without completely assimilating it. After this attempt to understand his visual culture, we came to wonder if the master of Ango Hours could be a member of Jean Levier's workshop or Jean Levier himself. Documentation goes in the direction of the connoisseurship's observations. Jean Levier starts his career in Gaillon in collaboration with Arnold of Nijmegen. He continues this collaboration for stained glass windows in Rouen and in Normandy, and he explores the Antwerp mannerism after 1520, when he got in touch with Engrand Le Prince, to whom he asked stained glasses for a church in Rouen. The longevity of Jean Levier, he died in 1555. His social importance in Rouen, where he was not regarded as an ordinary pa painter. In fact, at his death, he's buried in solemn funerals. <laughs> just like Van Eyck. Mm. <laughs> and the list of his connection with the court intersects his life perfectly with what could be deduced from the group Ango Akari in terms of style, model used, chronology, and patrons. Jean Levier had a son, Richard, who took the charge of the workshop in 1545, but he was already active before. His death around 1547, before his father's, corresponds at the end of the activity of the master of Girard Akari in the art of illumination. Therefore, we don't exclude that he can be the master of Girard Akari. And it is very touching because we find them together in a manuscript that we saw recently in Wormsley Library. And this manuscript, it is, it is a psalter of Anne Boleyn. <laughs> so in conclusion, through those exemplary cases, our communication wanted to demonstrate how the digitalization of the manuscripts gave a fresh impulse to connoisseurship, bringing new results, and why the versatility of the painters should be used as a practical tool for connoisseurship. The program Pandre en France à la Renaissance is a laboratory in which we experiment and then develop. Each resurrected painter, such as Loni, Changenet, or Le Vieil, will be the subject of a monograph in the next years in an editorial series articulated on the program. Uh, and it was initiated by Professor Elzig uh, with a book uh, last year on Grégoire Gerhard, uh, who is a Dutch painter active in France at the beginning of beginning of the 16th century. In the academic sphere, uh, particularly in French academic sphere, <laughs> our research <laughs> highlights the driving role that connoisseurship must continue to play so that art history could remain a dynamic discipline founded on, work, on the works of art and able to question and reinvent itself. We thank you, mm -hmm. and uh, we are happy to answer at your uh, question, but maybe it will be a little hard to mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will need some help. Thank you so much. All right, so are there, are there questions? in the room to begin with? I have a starting question, which is, I wonder whether the, with the methodology that you've established and the um, developments that you have had from it, whether you feel there are any implications for the training of students in art history. Yes, of course, uh, um, this is a very, this is something very important for us because we, we had the seminary um, on connoisseurship in the University of Geneva, and in the academic sphere, it is something like, um, it is something very rare. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we trained uh, many students, and we were uh, very surprised with the progress that students made very quickly with the method, method of connoisseurship. Actually, the problem with the connoisseurship is that it's a method uh, which is exposed 
only in the museal institution and not in the academic sphere. And I think students, and we have our cases, are really um, found, um, they, they really want to learn, they really, really want to understand. And this method um, allows them to make discoveries and to publish very quickly. And we have students that we attached at our program with discoveries on painting in France in the 15th and 16th century. So I think in the future, um, the academic sphere must, uh, must come back to connoisseurship, I think. I think it is important to understand first the materiality of the work of art, of work, works of art and then um, explain them uh, with theories and concepts. I don't, so, I don't know if I... <laughs> <laughs> no, that, okay. Does anybody yeah. else have a... No, no, I, I would like to, to say that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, connoisseurship, as you know, in the academic sphere in Europe, uh, is uh, uh, viewed in uh, a bad way. And so it's very important in the university to teach these methods because uh, it's important to... Uh, to, to train the, the, the curators, the future okay. curators, and so on. We have uh, no school of uh, cu uh, curators and so on in Switzerland, and so it's, it's important for us. And it's very important to uh, write and to teach on the methodological basis of connoisseurship, because uh, it's linked with subjectivity, with intuition, and, uh, and so we need to have a, a solid basis for the method uh, in order to uh, have uh, um, a stimulation for the students uh, in, uh, the, in the field of In order to understand that it is not something that came like that, oh, mm. I have an intuition, is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. No, mm. <laughs> there is something else and it must be explained. Right. Uh, Question here? I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the, the allograph, is it on? The allograph technique mm. and, and the pro particular problems mm. that that poses. And you, yeah. you did mention embroidery, but one um, medium that is that you haven't talked about is, is tapestry. So I'd like to right. hear um, well, now, your thoughts uh, on first, that. First, uh, we, we didn't say that so the term allograph uh, is borrowed to the linguistic, to the theory of Gérard Genette, uh, and uh, in, in a way uh, to say uh, the indi indirect, indirect techniques uh, in which uh, a conception is uh, uh, executed by another craftsman. And uh, it's very important to make this distinction to understand uh, the importance of invention in the connoisseurship and uh, to uh, make attribution to the same personality. Uh, in the documents, we have a lot of examples of painters uh, who are also sculpture, embroiders, and so on. And uh, uh, it's uh, not an originality of our time, it's uh, rather a way to conform to the reality uh, as documented uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. So uh, we, we have those painters that are documented as embroiders also. Uh, I don't have an example for somebody who, who, who makes tapestry, but we have, for example, a student that um, who makes made some some convincing uh, approach, uh, some convince uh, rapprochement connection. connection, some convincing connection between Nicolas Froment and uh, uh, an, unknown, an unknown tapestry now in Milan. So we have uh, things like that. We, uh, our, main, our, main, um, our main interest is in panel paintings, but we are dealing all the time with this intermediality. We, are, we have also, we, found, we, we find always painters uh, who are stained glass painters, 
who are illuminators, so it's, it's very complex. And I don't know if it is particular to French territory, uh, but in French territory, one must understand that those peoples are really able to do everything. Mm. <laughs> oui, this, uh, uh, for, the <laughs> for, for the embroidery, uh, we, we quoted uh, the name of Jean Hortin. Uh, if the ident identification is correct, uh, we know him under the name of Master of Roman de la Rose of Vienna, Vienna Roman de la Rose. And uh, we know only, we only know uh, miniatures by him. But uh, we know another names, uh, for example, Pierre Escrich, who was trained as an embroiderer and uh, uh, then uh, developed his career as a painter, as an uh, illuminator, and so on. So we, we have uh, several examples linked with these two fields. Any other? Uh, yeah. uh, just to um, go back to the teaching bit, um, do you have any practical recommendations of how you structure a course? Do you give a manuscript illumination to your students and ask them to compare it to, I don't know, uh, embroidery or tapestry? I mean, what, what, in your experience as teachers, what has worked? And how do you incorporate manuscript illumination as a source for connoisseurship vis-a-vis -vis mm. other uh, media? So asking just for some <laughs> tips. Thank you. You want um, to answer? Yes, but um, I'm afraid I, that my answer will be very simple because I don't know if I can say that in English. So actually, we articulate every single year the seminary with our project. Every year we study a city in particular. Uh, and uh, for example, this year was Bourges. And our seminary is for the fall semester Bourges in the 15th century and for the uh, spring semester Bourges in, uh, uh, in the 16th century. So we take the most important dossier, uh, dossier, dossier <laughs> uh, <laughs> file, file. <laughs> we take the most important dossier, for example, we take Barthélemy Deik and we give that to a student uh, he must understand all the um, historiography, how Bartholomew Dake is born, and he has actually a goal. <laughs> he has to, to find what I call, and you have to help me, les failles argumentatives. Oh, the, 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 mm. The logical fallacy, actually, and this is a big problem in the in the painting, in the study of the painting in the French uh, on the French territory. Actually, we are dealing with some doxas here that we must uh, a little bit review, and every dossier is full of argumentative uh, fa fa fallacies and. When you discover the dossier, you have uh, panel paintings, you have uh, illumination, and um, students are like an <laughs> opening up <laughs> of the eyes, and they came with proposition, with confrontation, with comparison, and it's something that it works very well. Actually, we, we give them trust in their self. Um, we, we tell them to see with their eyes. If Barthélemy Deik it doesn't work as an identification, they have to prove it. And they prove it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is the method. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's trying to do something. It's trying to renew. Not listening every time the same story about Barthélemy Deik, Josely Ferrand, uh, mm -hmm. which one? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jean Dipre, André Dipre, and so on. For the uh, 15th century, uh, illumination uh, is a reference technique because there is a lot of miniatures and we have a, a coherent ensemble 
uh, to study uh, connoisseurship. Uh, for uh, the 16th century, it's rather a stained glass window, which is a reference uh, technique. And in the two cases, we have uh, different uh, uh, problems because in the first, in illumination, we have a direct technique, and in the second, an indirect, potentially indirect. Uh, but uh, in, it's very important to have a, a, a theoretical basis of connoisseurship and to understand the distinction between invention and execution and understand the connection between these two categories. And so uh, we have always uh, the, the uh, two, three uh, uh, introduction courses to uh, put a solid basis uh, uh, in connoisseurship and go uh, the, to, to, to visit museums and libraries like you, you do here uh, together because it, it's very important uh, that the students, our students, have a, a very uh, precise uh, familiarity with materiality of objects. It's uh, the basis. It's in the academic sphere in Europe, uh, the digitalized era <laughs> doesn't come. <laughs> I mean, students in art history doesn't, um, doesn't know that all those bases exist because we don't do uh, we don't do it the essential in art history. We do very much theory, very much concepts, but we don't study works of art. And uh, it was a surprise for them <laughs> to discover <laughs> uh, that they can uh, read a manuscript, a medieval manuscript, uh, in front of their uh, of their screen. I know it sounds crazy, but this is the reality. We are we are so we are so there like Antichrist. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but I really think that connoisseurship uh, is the future of our discipline. We must go there. We must go back there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.